So hopefully I can provide something that uh, gives you a bit of a takeaway or gives you something to consider uh, going forward with uh, when you're looking to, um, to decide what, uh, what interest rates in terms of structure, whether it be variable or fixed, uh, that might be appropriate for your business. So um, just a little bit about Robinson Sewell Partners. Um, I don't know whether that's too familiar with uh, people here, but we're, we're a debt advisory and, and a tax depreciation specialist business. Um, Michael's going to, uh, to speak in a second. We've split this up into two parts. So we'll do interest rates and, and tax depreciation. So Michael is the expert on the tax depreciation. He'll do the, the, uh, the second part of, the, of our topic. Um, and yeah, so with the debt advisory that we, that we do, we, uh, what, what our role is there that we partner with farmers and look to uh, negotiate on their behalf uh, to obtain um, the most uh, competitive, I guess, arrangements that they have with their finance uh, and also look at these type of things with, uh, with fixed and variable as to what the best structure is to, uh, to have with their, with, their, with their funding package. So um, just in terms of what we're looking to uh, uh, go through um, there today, um, and I've probably broken it up, I just want to cover off quickly and we're probably I think quite familiar with, with how our interest rates are determined but just, just going to, uh, to go through that quickly just as a bit of a, uh, an e economics update I suppose. I must uh, point out that I'm not a, uh, an economist though so some of it's probably very much layman terms. So um, uh, The other points that we're going to try and that I'll uh, look at as we go through is just when we're looking at some of how those interest rate markets are, are determined and, and what the uh, what the history has been. I'm just going to cover off and just show you, I, I hope, um, how difficult it is to time markets uh, um, when you're looking at um, some of those historical sort of results that we've seen. So, uh, so the second point that we're looking covering off, uh, and then looking at the risk and impact. I guess uh, our business looks to to quantify the decision making process that we have with uh, with fixed and variable interest rates. So what we apply is sort of a risk and impact scenario um, and I guess that will cover off that as we go just to explain how that sort of works. And there's, a, there's sort of four common approaches uh, just identifying where people sort of sit when, they, when they're you know, sometimes addressing or looking at, uh, at, uh, at that decision making process. So, um, and I don't know whether you've, you've seen uh, AgriPath and the, um, what, how they do with a lot of their their analysis but I guess at the end of the day I, we'd like to think that uh, your, your finance and your your interest rate decisions are sort of based on some sort of uh, analysis that's, uh, that's relevant to your business. So I think at the end of the day, what we sort of try and uh, encourage is that, you know, you go through the sums and look at where, what the, what the impacts are or potential impacts may be with, uh, with some of that decision making process. So, uh, so just starting back, yeah, so how interest rates are determined. Um, and I'll just go through this pretty quickly because I think I've been going over time pretty well every presentation. So, but I think most of us would be pretty familiar with, uh, with what the R RBA does. Uh, we hear obviously every month about what, uh, what their decision has been on the cash rate. Um, one of the main things that they do is, is the uh, monetary policy. It's one of the, the um, uh, implements that the government has given it to, uh, to manage. Um, and also I guess through that, yeah, that it does manage some of our gold and foreign exchange. It does play a role as a bank uh, to some government agency. So. Probably a few things there that you may not have been familiar with. Um, so one of its uh, big objectives is to uh, control inflation. Um, and I think, yeah, again, you might be aware of that sort of target that was brought in around the 1990s to keep inflation around that sort of desired between that 2 to 3% sort of long-term average sort of figure. So the idea of that was obviously to uh, you know, preserve the value of money. Um, and keep, you know, maintain strong and, and um, sustainable growth in the longer term. So those that might be familiar with the period where we had high inflation and high interest rates, um, yeah, certainly was uh, um, meant that it was a very volatile period. So their objective following that, which as I said, was to bring that in uh, as a policy in the 1990s. So just to show where that sort of changed and how inflation did sort of spike over, over those periods preceding that. Uh, here's the point where you know, the policy was to try and control that inflation measure um, and you'll probably see that they've probably been quite successful other than a few spikes there in terms of where we were subject to inflation quite high um, in some of those preceding, preceding periods. So just a good sort of uh, chart I think just to probably put that in perspective. Um, 
the inflation sort of uh, policy that they have, one of the, the, the main levers that they have to maintaining that target is using interest rates as a, as a lever. Uh, obviously by increasing interest rates where they're looking to put, slow down the economy, uh, decreasing rates, we're looking to sort of put a bit of um, confidence and put a bit of sort of um, momentum back into the economy. So that's probably one of the main levers that they use. And I guess that's what, what I was just using that as a bit of a sounding or a bit of a background as to uh, talking further about interest rates. So uh, in terms of how that, that lever has sort of worked and what's sort of happened over the last, uh, what's that, 25 years or so, we can see um, where some of those um, um, periods of, uh, of cash rate movement, and that's the overnight that the RBA announces, um, that there has been some quite, quite serious sort of, particularly, uh, obviously that's um, GFC period where the uh, RBA was looking to stimulate growth in the economy f uh, following that event. So um, this period here was probably on the back of, um, uh, well, was on the back of Chinese and Indian economies. Um, we're seeing sort of growth coming into, and they were probably looking to uh, put a bit of a handbrake on, on inflation and, and consequently um, increasing interest rates to uh, uh, keep a lid on that. So that was that period there. We've seen sort of this period here where globally the, uh, uh, the economy uh, has come under pressure, so interest rates have, have also come under pressure in, in a, an attempt to try and stimulate and keep that economy growing. So a couple of periods here, that was the, um, uh, where again, another um, share market with the, uh, um, was a period when the, the dot-com um, bubble, where we saw that there was some, some pretty massive things, and again, yeah, interest rates were, were come off, and that was, I think, September 2011 was in that sort of period there. So. So you can see it's a reactive trigger that the uh, RBA uses to try and either stimulate or, or to slow down the economy. So, um, so now, we sh now we've had that sort of uh, economy lesson. Um, we'll just move on to then sort of uh, how fixed rates then relate to that. Um, short term rates are, are measured off bank bill swap rates. Longer term rates are off the three and 10 year government bond markets. So um, like these, these markets are traded daily. So they will have sentiment of, of supply and demand will come into that and obviously where people are forecasting or expecting those markets to sort of go so but generally what you can sort of see is that they will follow a similar path so we can sort of see there that we've still got that GFC period um, and we've got sort of the similar trends that will probably occur in the in the cash rate sort of scenario but it does this is a 10-year government bond yield uh, chart so you can see from that that um, you know it's quite obviously a lot more uh, choppy um, in where market is sort of anticipating. And it's probably interesting to note that there hasn't been, whilst uh, uh, we've had some uptrends here, the longer term trend, if we drew a line across the bottom on the top of where, where, the, where the, the prices have gone, uh, we could see that the trend just at the moment is continued to be in a downward trend. Um, and we've probably had a number of spikes here which have sort of indicated, well, maybe we are only sort of for it to fall away. And there's probably people in the room maybe that have have looked to lock in their fixed rates at various times when we're, we're, you know, the market has sort of thought, well, have we seen the bottom? Uh, we're now heading up. Um, and obviously then only to find that there's been subsequent sort of, you know, 2% sort of fall on the downside. I know personally that I, uh, was with my home loan here, I thought uh, at that time, following that was after the dot-com sort of debacle, um, we saw markets start to pick up and there was some good in the economy with, uh, with the sort of, I suppose, early days of the, of the mining boom. And I thought, happy days, here we go. I'm gonna lock in for 10 years. Uh, so I locked my home loan in for 10 years. Uh, it cost me, I think about 120 points to do that. Uh, so it took a couple of years before, before it got to sort of, to the point where I was probably, uh, you know, just starting to be above where I would have been if I had stayed on variable. Um, and then GFC hit, so, and then just kept falling. So yeah, it wasn't probably such a good strategy, so. Um, but it's probably just to highlight that, yeah, picking the market, uh, even though, um, you know, sentiment at the time or, or knowledge of the time would indicate that, that the market's heading in that direction, quite often uh, it can be that things can change quite dramatically, quite quickly. So I guess that was a lesson that I learned, that picking or timing the market can be, can be fraught with danger at times. So again, that's just a correlation between the short term, the short term, uh, you know, the swap rate markets um, that operate, and then we have our th this in this case three-year 
um, fixed rates that sort of, as you can see, uh, they sort of correlate quite closely there. So as I said, what, uh, what's the approach that we take? Um, and I guess the essence of it is to really try and identify what, uh, in, in two, two words, what's the risk and what's the impact. And so the risk is that the chance of that, or the probability of something happening, and the impact is uh, if it does, it does occur, what's going to be the result or the cost of that, of that happening. So obviously as farmers, we're probably making those risk and impact decisions every day, whether it be uh, at what time we're sowing, what time we're spraying, what time we're, you know, when we're harvesting, when we're marketing. So it's a common approach I think that we would, we, we would all adopt and probably quite often we do it subconsciously, but probably sometimes with interest rate markets, we probably do it more, I think at times, on a bit of a, of a hunch or on probably what, uh, what we believe or what we hear in the market sort of thing. So um, with interest rates, yeah, our risk is sort of, do we, do we uh, go variable and, and take the risk that markets aren't going to uh, move too much higher um, or do we fix it and cover ourselves on that risk of, the, of, of uh, interest rates going higher? So um, identifying or, or looking at that sort of probability is probably where that risk and impact and what impact is that going to have on our business if, uh, if it does go either higher or lower. So um, I guess in terms of uh, um, when we do hedge and so when we do lock a fixed rate in, uh, the obvious reason that we're doing it is to look at protecting ourselves from upside in the market. Um, but there's probably a number of things that we probably also need to consider uh, when we're doing that, as I said, rather than just be looking at sort of thinking that uh, we're going to cover ourselves. And obviously it's a premium, as I said, in my case, um, when I looked at it, it was about 120 points was what I had to give up. Uh, the difference between what the variable rate was at that time and the cost of, uh, of going fixed, albeit mine was on a, on a longer, you know, a fairly long term. But that's, uh, I guess, the initial cost is quite visible, that, that part of the equation. Um, so yeah, so that's obviously one of the first costs that you would sort of recognise or need to sort of measure. Uh, the other thing that you'd, you'd need to measure with a, f with a fixed rate, obviously there's uh, a number of restrictions if you wanted to reduce that debt uh, and various lenders and banks will have uh, different restrictions that will apply with how much you can pay off that debt over that, over that contract period. So, so it's another factor that you would need to take into consideration. The, the other is a break cost and again I guess before you're fixing it you need to be sort of um, discussing or liaising with your bank to make sure that you're fully aware of um, how those calculations are, are, are carried out. Um, some banks, whilst they're probably similar to a degree, there is some variation with, with how that's calculated. Um, and it needs to be, yeah, at times, if particularly if, if, the, if, the, um, if you need to break when there's been a, a two or three percent movement uh, against where you, where you locked your rate in, then those costs can be quite, uh, quite considerable. So it's need to be uh, something that you're very mindful of. Um, and obviously that, yeah, if it does go, it doesn't, you know, it is going down, you've got that opportunity cost that you're sort of wearing as well. So there are probably things that we're all familiar with, uh, but we're just wanting to sort of, um, you know, I think when you're making that decision making through, through these, uh, through either fixed or variable, it needs to be sort of at the forefront of what, uh, of your decision making sort of, decisions that you do. So the other thing is just with some banks that the risk grade margin that you do when you're doing a fixed rate uh, can be locked in on, on that particular contract. So um, with any business lending what we have obviously is, um, is a base rate that a bank will have and they'll apply a, a margin whether that be a plus or a minus depending on their base that will be uh, reflective of where that business and it's um, the bank's position or profile on that business is. So by locking in your or your fixed rate, quite often you might be locking in that actual margin on that uh, when you're taking that contract out. So just need to be mindful of that as well. So they're sort of the costs that we see that, or that you may be facing or that you need to consider when you're doing that. So, so I guess in looking at different people and how they approach this, I said there's probably a few scenarios that sort of uh, seem to come to, come to, uh, to the fore. Um, we see the gambler, and I guess that's, that's where I was, my sort of head was sort of lying. I, I was predicting that I could uh, outsmart the banks and, and look at sort of trying to get in before potential sort of what I thought was going to be a long period of, uh, of higher interest rates. So I gambled on that, uh, on that aspect and probably without looking at the full considerations that I should have done. So 
the second point is probably the, the procrastinator. So where we've got a position that might be under some fairly uh, tight margin pressure um, and funding pressure that they really probably need to be looking to um, uh, make sure that their, their exposure with their interest rates um, doesn't become something that's going to affect the, the long-term viability of the business. So, but they stand on the sidelines sort of waiting for, that, uh, for someone to ring that bell to say we've just hit the bottom of the market. And um, I know by experience it just doesn't happen that someone rings a bell while there's a number of people that claim that they, they have a bell and they say that we've now hit the bottom. It doesn't, um, you know, it, there's nothing for certain with, uh, with that. And we've probably, I think, in the last, as I said, with that long-term downward trend that we've had, I think it's caught a lot of people out over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So the other person is really just a risk taker. They're looking to just sort of bet on the, on the market sort of going one way or the other. So again, probably not led by sort of fundamentals, uh, more on where they see direction sort of going. And the last, uh, I guess, sort of approach and, and one that we sort of adopt and like to sort of think that people will, will take into consideration is, is, um, is the rationale. So someone that looks to, to make more of an analytical and measured approach when they're, when they're taking this uh, decision. So, um, so some of the questions that you should be asking when you're sort of doing that and, and to come into that sort of more rationale sort of thinking process is, and I know it's probably a little bit crystal ball sometimes with where you're forecasting, but if you've got some future capital requirements or movements, that, whether that be for, um, you know, for purchases or sales, so you may look to be having to re reorganise your debt structure in the, in the chewing sort of period, uh, it's probably not a good time to be sort of fixing because you will, there, there may be then break costs that will be associated. So um, trying to sort of uh, plan where, th where things may occur in the short term can, uh, can make sort of that decision making process a lot easier. And that, what percentage of that capital that may be required to be mobile so that you can make those decisions. Um, how sensitive is the business? As I mentioned there just previously that uh, if you're under tight margin pressure then you may be very sensitive. Otherwise it may be that you feel um, that uh, you know, your business is able to handle um, a 1 to 2 percent increase and so you're, you're happy to wear that over the, over the ensuing three to five year period. Generally, the hedging place will take over, over that three to five year period. The cost of funding probably blows out too long, too much when you go out any further than that. Um, so you, yeah, I guess it's identifying how sensitive you are to those sort of movements or potential movements that may occur. And probably the key one there is, is how much premium are you foregoing uh, on that fixed rate? We're probably seeing in recent times that given the period that we've had that um, interest rates and the, and the lack of movement uh, that we've had that the premium now with it between variable and fixed rates quite, quite, uh, quite tight, uh, particularly in the, in the first couple of years. So um, it probably means, yeah, that that's not, not such a big consideration, but yeah, certainly in, um, at times that can be a major factor in terms of how you make that decision. And the last point there, I guess, is, is, is just sort of saying that, yeah, whilst interest rates, and I guess it's probably on the back of uh, a number of people having to, uh, or, or being subject to large opportunity costs in recent times with fixing probably at the, at the point when they thought it was a bottom. Uh, it might be that yeah, your business with, uh, if you've got considerable assets there that are gaining an appreciation or land values are appreciating, in some ways you've got a natural hedge against you know, maintaining your equity. So it may be that, uh, yeah, um, or you're expecting increased profits as probably we all like to think that we, we you know, are going to achieve greater profits that in, in essence your business probably does have a natural hedge um, against, as I said, maintaining um, the equity within the business. So they're the sort of considerations that we like to go through with, uh, with businesses just to sort of understand and try and plan it around uh, what, what's likely to happen in the, you know, in the coming future and where the business is sort of looking to go so that the decision that we're making on fixed rates or interest rates or variable rates uh, has more of a sound basis to it. So. Uh, we probably should have put a real case study up, but I've just put a bit of a scenario up here in terms of um, uh, someone who's got a, a $5 million um, debt facility that they're looking to borrow on. Um, and the various rates, as I said, I've got a rate there, 4.25, uh, so they indicate that they're probably a fairly strong business. The three year rate at 5.25, as I said, that's probably uh, a little bit higher than what we're currently seeing. Uh, and the five year rate at 5.85. Um, if they were looking to, to hedge some of that exposure and, and look to take 1.5 for three years and 1.5 for five years, 
effectively what they've they've got is a weighted average premium of 1.3. So those two um, of it added together because we're both borrowing 1.5. Uh, is the premium that they're paying on that on three million of the five million over the first uh, over the first three years? So, um, so without playing it out through through a case study, uh, what needs to happen um, would be that the, assuming uh, the banks at this time didn't there wasn't any um, movements outside of cash rates and the banks moved <laughs> moved their rates uh, in line with the RBA's assumed twenty five basis points each time, then you're going to need five basis um, or five movements to actually um, before that, that hedge breaks even in terms of catching up with that premium. What you've got to also take into consideration though is that there's a time cost with that as well. So whilst you've, you've been uh, you know, 100 and, um, 125 points behind, over that time you'll have to have time that will, will then allow you to sort of make up for that sort of period where you've, you've paid a premium over that uh, uh, over that fixed rate. So, so I guess as, as I said, probably what we're, we're looking to do is to sort of work out what that premium is. Uh, that's probably the critical factor within. Um, and look at sort of where the, you know, where the costs are associated on those, not just on the, on the premium, but uh, the overall costs in terms of um, uh, likelihood of um, um, potential break costs and, and see where the perceived benefits are. We're looking to, to cover, um, you know, as I said, put more analytics behind the whole equation. And look at your own, your own business's sort of needs or individual sort of decisions to make um, an informed decision rather than make a hunch or a bet. So uh, the benefits, I think, you know, when you're doing this sort of be, need to be in where your business is looking to go uh, rather than probably sort of what the banks or what they're looking to, to offer you at that time. So in saying all that, uh, it's probably, and I, without sort of putting my head on the, on the chopping block, I would, I would sort of, um, you know, if you've been someone who's, Either been burnt probably in the past with fixed rates and, and picking, you know, sort of time, sort of uh, at this period here where we bounced, or this here, period here, um, and and subject, and then we're subject to you know either uh, large opportunity costs or even large break costs if you if you did uh, did decide to um, to break out of that contract early. Um, you know, I think that we've had quite a sustained period. If you look at that, there's you know there's 12, 10 or 12 years there of sort of of a downward trend. Um, I think at the moment that we're probably, you know, the case for looking or considering fixed rates is probably a lot more. Given that sustained period, we're on a, uh, the risk on the downside um, is probably a lot less than what the risk is on the, on the upside. So by covering off that, um, I think that, you know, consideration should be weighted. But certainly I would, would, uh, would think that you need to take strong consideration of, of the risk and impacts that might, uh, that might occur. So. Um, so I guess we do it by case by case uh, with clients and sort of go through through the scenario with probably rather than taking a as I said a bit of a punt or a hedge on the or, you know, or a hunch on the market. So is there any? That's probably about it for me. If there was any questions or on that. <coughs>